We're back with our panel, D.C. Congress member Eleanor Holmes Norton, uh, Lindy Steinhorn, History and Communications Professor at American University, and Julian Ivey, member of the uh, Chevrolet City Council. Let, let me ask this, and, and I don't want to turn this into a partisan kind of conversation, but uh, us average folk, okay, black people, white people, brown people, yellow people, what do we need to do today? I mean, we're, we're talking about Dr. King, a lot of us can recite some of his speeches, but what can we as individuals do? I think we have to look at his unfinished business. You have to ask yourself, where did he get that bandwidth from? Uh, once he had uh, been, if not chiefly responsible, leading the, the, the monumental achievement of two great civil rights bills, mm -hmm. uh, what made him plow into the Vietnam War much earlier than almost anybody else? And poor people's campaign, when you're dealing with American capitalism, are you out of your mind? It's as if he was restless for in, injustice. His sense of social justice was so broad that in, in the um, Shakespearean sense, you could think of him as a tragic figure. His fatal flaw may have been that he insisted upon expanding into parts of injustice that not even King could have sustained. Yeah, you know, one of the things that's lost in these times, we forget about the, 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 the white members of clergy and others, you, you know, who rode the buses and who risked their lives, gave their lives in some instances. Uh, we forget about them now, as though this is a black time, and let black people have this time to, to think. But, but uh, Lenny, not just because you're the white guy sitting here, <laughs> speak for them, though, and those people that are hurting very much, you know, because things haven't come as far as Dr. King would have liked. Well, I think the bottom line is the civil rights, the black experience is the American experience. We all share in this together. We all own it together. We all have to do something about it together. And to be a true patriot, you have to think about the history of race and racism and bigotry and discrimination every single day. And I think that's what everybody in our society should be embracing. You know, Dr. King saw two types of tension in society. The negative tension, he said, is the absence of justice. A positive tension is a movement towards shaking things up so that we have a more just society. I think people run from tension, but the bottom line is we should race toward it if it makes us better as a people. Embrace it, accept it, because progress involves hard work. And I think that's what all those folks involved in civil rights in the 60s, white and black, Latino, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, they all recognized that you had to go through a little bit of tension to be able to uh, maintain a great deal of justice. But part of what I sense is that we, we are so far away from what Dr. King had in mind mm -hmm. with what's going on. We're, 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 it's tribalism. We're, we're all in our little camps here. And if I don't have this, because you got it from me. Mm -hmm. and, and, and fear is, is the fuel that seems to be just tossed around on the flames constantly every day you know, in this country. Julian? Yeah, we just need to remember uh, the legacy that he wanted to leave behind, uh, that he wanted to bring people of all races and creeds and religions together uh, and, and wonder where would Dr. King stand uh, with the, these movements that are going on now, the Black Lives Matter movement as I mentioned earlier, but also the hashtag Me Too movement uh, and the, the Enough is Enough movement. Where would Dr. King stand uh, when dealing with illegal immigration? Um, and it's just quite clear that he would stand with the people um, who are in a vulnerable state. Uh, he would be marching currently uh, with individuals who are in the Black Lives Matter movement, Enough is Enough movement. He'd be standing with uh, our immigrant, our vulnerable immigrant population. Question to everybody, do, do marches still work? They work a lot. Yeah. You've seen now the biggest marches. I was a, a, a SNCC student on violent coordinating commission kid who worked in the March on Washington. We thought that we had conquered the world when 250,000 people came to Washington. Yeah. Well, look what happened to the Women's March. Yeah. That was 500,000. It looks like these marches do work. We're about to get, mark my word, a change in the Congress, at least in the House, of what we think, because the marches have led to people understanding what next, and what next is politics. And getting an awful lot of women running for office. I'm you know, Bruce, you said something earlier that's really important. I think we've sort of devolved in this, into this sort of unfortunate zero-sum game society. Mm -hmm. If you're up, I'm down. If you and I lose, we have to go to this win-win culture that if 
you win, I win, because I'm a better person and we're a better society because we are all winning this together. And unfortunately, people pit each uh, other th against each other. Um, they, they say if, if somebody else is, is getting attention paid to them, well, then nobody's paying attention to me. I think we have to change that, particularly with an understanding of our history of discrimination, slavery, segregation in this country. We have to address that as a nation, and it doesn't mean that white people are losing because we're paying attention to that history. We all win when we transform. All right, last word. Back in a minute.